each of the parts in a MIME archive has a MIME type. And if you say my part handler, you know, handles types text slash go cubs, then anytime that MIME after your part handler is at the beginning, and then anywhere subsequently that you got one of those MIME types, you'll get called as a handler. And then each of these things are basically implemented as handlers, and they just operate on the parts. So you can easily get code in. Basically, so, I don't know. So what else does CloudNet do? You can run your code, extract your user data, and through the configuration it can do lots of different things. The, I mean, the, the initial primary things it can do is, the, the very bare bones thing that you want it to do is to import SSH keys that you said, so that you can then SSH in. And you want to be able to, um, I mean, really the execute code goes a long way, just the shebang is really quite, that was Eric Hammond's original idea and that was just very good. It came, gets you a lot of the way to being able to reuse stuff. Um, Something else CloudNet will do is, if you've got an instant, if you've got a disk image for Amazon, most of their, most of the instances have different sized disks. So, um, if you have one image format, if you have one image, it has a partition table in it, right? And the partition table has a beginning and an end, and so the partition one is of size two gigabytes or eight gigabytes. Well, that's not very useful if you want to be able to launch it on a disk with. 160 gig, or 320 gig, or a terabyte, whatever. Um, so, and the way that those are implemented most most of the time, when you have a different size, is the hypervisor just pad zeros at the end of your disk, right? So there's just extra space. Well, CloudInit comes up and it says, "Oh look, your partition table is not use your root partition could use all that extra space." So it will rewrite the partition table and then grow the, part, the root partition so that then when your code starts executing, instead of having just two gigabytes, whatever, of space, you'll use the whole disk. You can turn that off now in case you actually want to do something else with that additional disk space. But, um, and you can do that. You can turn that off via user data. That was a nice feature. Um, let's see. Cloud, it adds the default user um, in the cloud images from Ubuntu. We don't have a user hard coded in there. There's no default password. There's no way into that instance basically at all until CloudNet operates and says it adds a user and it adds that user with those SSH keys. You can set a password through Cloud Config, um, but mostly it's done through SSH keys. But uh, so yeah, those those three things at the top are the big ones. After that, you can do a lot of different things. CloudNet picks the right mirror on Amazon, um, so that if you're on US East One, you get a mirror from US East One versus somewhere else. Um, this is the list of clouds <coughs> that uh, CloudNet supports getting user data and metadata from. Metadata being things like host name and um, SSH keys where user data is customization script or whatnot. Um, Moz is one that is, uh, if you're not familiar with Moz, I, you should check that out. Uh, Moz is Canonical's or, and Ubuntu's metal as a service. It allows you to treat a bunch of hardware as if it were a cloud itself. So you can launch an instance which would provision bare metal hardware feed it user data and go from there. And actually, if, you, if you've tried it in the past, I suggest you try it again. I mean, it, it, in the past it's had bugs, it, and at this point it is, it is very slick. It works really well, honestly. It's, it's an impressive way if you've got a couple systems even just to play with that you can, you can do it. And also you can point it at virtual systems if you don't have a couple systems, but you have some VMs, you can play with it that way. Um, so that was CloudNet, and so that's where we're with CloudNet in 0.7.x, that's this, throughout most of its history it's been named 0.6 or 0.7, 
Um, we want to move towards CloudNet 2.0. Um, come on now. So CloudNet 2.0 is coming, it's in development, and we're trying to do some other things to clean up some code, to move it forward, to be more uh, more easily usable and utilizable, extensible, blah, blah, blah. Um, and to focus a little bit better on some, some things that I didn't do real well in CloudNet, which was some documentation um, and continuous integration and things. Um, we are changing a license from which was GPL v3 to Apache 2, which is interestingly more accessible to a lot of people, to a lot of companies. Um, CloudNet 2.0 will be in Python. And I wrote support 2.6, I think that's, yeah, we'll support 2.6 and RHEL 6, but nothing will own that for Python. Um, the big thing here is that are targeting support for Windows, which will be a complete revamp because I have exactly, I don't know, zero experience with Windows development. Um, and so most of that support is going to come from a company called Cloudbase. But we, we want to have Cloud Init working in both of those locations so that tools can, obviously, platform differences exist, but that they can treat instances of Windows similar to how they would treat instances of Ubuntu or Red Hat from, you know, to remove the initialization barrier. Obviously, there's all sorts of other barriers there. Um, but we'll get that one out of the way. And then FreeBSD is also supported. It's supported right now, but we want to go forward and, and do better operating system. The other big issue, the other big things is a persistent agent. Um, if you've used, you've launched a VM on um, VMware or lots of, let's see, I, in one way or another you may be familiar with what an agent is. Oftentimes they listen to commands from the hypervisor or the hypervisor can talk in and say, you know, um, the user thinks they're locked out, change their password. Rackspace offers an agent that runs inside all their instances that if you call them up on the phone and say, hey, I'm locked out, they can get you back in. It, it's essentially a rootkit of sorts. Um, lots of, there aren't, there are lots of agents available. The real value of Cloud Init having one is by it being everywhere as it's in Fedora images and Ubuntu images, if we put an agent into CloudNet, the agent will be present in lots of places, so you'll be able to expect it to be there and utilize it. Whereas right now, if you want to use the Nova agent or the QEMU's agent, most likely you have to install it. You can't just use an off-the-shelf OS provided image. Um, and then also you'll be able to Query the, the goal is to be able to query the state of CloudNet um, and probably do some things like list users, um, add users in real time, and then also other things like we want to do shutdown events and kind of more lifecycle things, just that that can be done if I have a persistent agent running. Um, and also networking and block device. Right now, CloudNet is very um, it's very remedial in how it works with networking. It kind of assumes that the disks or that the OS is configured to bring up all relative networking, relevant networking, and then it starts after all relevant networking is up. But on on Amazon and on OpenStack, you can hot plug a network adapter. You can say, add, plug this new, plug plug this adapter in. And then their metadata services will tell you what that network that network adapter's IP address should be or how it should be configured. And CloudNet just kind of doesn't do anything with that. Um, ideally, when you go to the Amazon 
web interface and you say attach this new device, attach it to that instance, you'll then go into your instance and already your instance has that IP address. So in Cloud and it will will have taken the hot plug event that says that's there, talked to the metadata service, said, hey, what should I do with this? Configured it, turned it on, and then it'd be ready to go. Right now that's stuff that a user would typically have to do themselves. Um, it's kind of obnoxious. Um, I guess basically the, the goal of 2.0 is to remove is to do more and more automation, to make systems more automatable, um, to make you able to expect things will happen and they will. Um, that was my whirlwind tour. And obviously I have lots of improvements to do on my talk. Um, does anybody have any questions? Sure. Well, five slides back, you were talking about basically your, uh, your shebang script kicks off an upstart job. What's the implication of uh, the general moving to system D? Does that change uh, so, um, so CloudInit allowed you to specify an upstart job should be placed down, and it would add it, and then upstart. May I have your attention, please? The time is now 8.30, and the library will be closing in 30 minutes at 9 o'clock. Please be advised that the internet will shut down 10 minutes before closing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank the you, entire Stephon. Internet. Great. <laughs> um, so CloudInit can basically take something and, and lay it down in Etsy and it, and then Upstart would fire it off, um, would, would handle the job. Now, yeah, with System D, one thing I need to do is to add it to be able to take a system D job and lay it down in the same way. Um, I had to, Cloud it needed to be, let's see, some people from Red Hat, from Fedora initially did the work for system D integration, so I had to redo that and to get system D jobs for Cloud it because it ran via Upstart and on other systems it runs via system 5 and Enter, however. Um, and RHEL 6 maybe get up there. Yeah, um, is that System Five? I'm pretty sure. Yeah, Go Five. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Seven's where they implemented System. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, there's there's System Five in its scripts. There's System D in its scripts, and there's.